We're in Tallgrass Tap House for another edition of the KSO Show, brought to you by Legacy Insurance and People State Bank. So, right now we have Logan Mance manning the board, <laughs> and Derek Young here with me, Grant Flanders, and then a little bit later on we will for sure get Matt Hall and maybe some John Kurtz in this as well. It's, it's been a minute since I've been on a podcast, I think I the know, last two weeks... I've been kind of doing my own thing. And well, you know, with our schedules, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we go all tough. over the place. But, yeah. uh, but DY, it's been a while since DY's been on one, too, I feel like. Right. No, I'm just yeah, <laughs> no, no, it's probably been a couple of weeks. Probably been a couple of weeks. But Texas week. Yeah, Texas week now, exciting one. I mean, really, three straight weeks of exciting football for K-State. Yeah, yeah, if you, th- yeah, if you think about it, Kleiman probably looked at the schedule and marked down these three games yeah. and said, if I could go two, two out of the three wins – you know, that'd probably be good for him, but no he, doubt. He, he could probably get all three. Yeah, he's 2-0 and so far. Yeah. Uh, beat Oklahoma unexpectedly at home. Insane win there. And then and then maybe the biggest game of the year, especially for recruiting, as D.Y. will tell you, they, they took down Kansas last weekend. And, yeah, I mean, talk about that, D.Y., how big that was for recruiting and, and just how big of a game that was in general for K-State. Yeah, in terms of recruiting, that, that game probably – has a more positive impact for Kansas State than the one prior, even though it's against the top five team in Oklahoma, just because of where they're going to recruit and kind of being able to knock KU down a few pegs while doing so. So it's pretty significant. And we talked about a three-game stretch, wanting to at least go two and one. Yeah. And technically they're, they, they had a three-game stretch and they did go three and oh, because this started with a win against TCU. Yeah, no doubt. And, and, we talked to Kleiman today, and obviously, you know, he's just he's just really good with the media. Even when they even when they took losses, which was not what Kleiman was used to, he was really good with the media. But now, he's on a, a stretch of two really good wins, going into a tough game in Austin. I mean, generally, Dy. I mean, what do you what do you look for it, going into this week? Off two really big wins. How do you keep this team uh, hyped up for a game that's going to be a tough one in Austin? Yeah, they're just going to have to kind of do what. They've kind of made the foundation and the culture of the team about, you know, winning each day and winning each week, of course, because it's, you know, they do run the the trap of perhaps getting Texas at the wrong time. The Longhorns are coming off a bye week. They're going to get a number of their starters back on defense that they haven't had in close to a month, Um, especially two really good players and B.J. Foster and and Caden Stearns. Caden Stearns was all Big 12 a year ago as a true freshman, so... Uh, they're getting a lot of guys back, and K-State's coming off two emotional weeks. So you do run the risk of, you know, perhaps getting the Longhorns at the wrong time. That's something that I'm kind of weary of and certainly something that I'm in the belief of. So, But we talked to the players today, talked to Clim- Coach Kleiman on Tuesday, and they certainly don't think that they're looking backwards. They, they, they appear to be looking forward. and. But they did also emphasize that it is something that they had to be mindful of, something that they had to concentrate and focus on was putting that win against Oklahoma and putting that win against KU in the rearview mirror. Easier said than done, but they've been trying to do that. And now, I mean, you're looking at a team that a little banged up for K-State as far as, I mean, probably the biggest news is Kleiman brought up is A.J. Parker going to be out for an extended period of time. He might know more uh, within the next week, but... I mean, how big is that loss, especially going into Texas? Yeah, there's certainly an argument to be made that he was probably their best secondary player thus far this year. Um, he's made his, his fair share of plays, missed a couple of golden opportunities here and there, but definitely been a, uh, a much better season for A.J. Parker compared to last year and probably is starting to be in the discussion for some of the top corners in the Big 12, so you're always going to feel that loss. Uh, the good thing for Kansas State is his two replacements, the ones that we anticipated it being and the ones that Coach Kleiman shared today, are two seniors that have actually played quite a bit this season in Kivio McGee and Darrell Patterson. Not only that, Kivio McGee played quite a bit last year as well. Yeah. Darrell Patterson played, I think, five games last season too. So uh, not going to have A.J. Parker, but – the what do I want to say is the, the it, it's not bare. The cupboard is not bare. They have two seniors yeah. that they feel like they can count on. It's, it's not two seniors that have just played in garbage time here and there. They played in meaningful snaps this season. A lot of first team uh, experience for, from both of them. 
I think one thing you worry about is if these guys can step up and make plays. You think about A.J. Parker. He's had big turnovers, the one against Oklahoma, and he's had a few others. And you just think, can these guys step in and make plays? Because I think they fit in the system. They can pull, keep guys in front of them. But can they make that turnover, which K-State usually needs to and win I, a game? Yeah, and now you have a healthy Texas coming in. And what do they have offensively, weapons-wise? One of the scarier teams in the Big 12 as far as that goes. Talk about how difficult that will be for these for these guys without A.J. Parker there. Yeah, they're getting a lot of explosion from the running backs this year. Uh, but I don't think that they're – it's a really good offense because Sam Ellinger is a good player. Um, he's a tough player. He does the little things very well. But for some reason, one reason or another, they're not necessarily explosive across the board like you would expect the Longhorns to be. Uh, Obviously, three really good receivers that I like, and Devin DuVernay, yeah. uh, Colin Johnson, Brennan Eagles, the freshman, is probably the one with the that probably has the most potential. But DuVernay is the guy that they've been able to rely on the most. I think he leads the Big 12 in receptions by a wide margin. So, uh, Which is impressive considering who's in this league. Yeah, so uh, DuVernay is a really good player, and Colin Johnson's a really good player. But they haven't really gotten loose for a lot of big plays, which is something that's kind of hurt Kansas State this season. Uh, although – the Wildcats responded to that very well against KU. KU didn't have any big plays. KU didn't have much of any plays against Kansas State's defense, but it's going to be a challenge regardless. They have good players. It's just they haven't had a whole lot of big playability from the Longhorns, and you'd expect them to be a little bit more explosive than they've shown so far this season. And I think uh, after Sam Ellinger throwing four picks against yeah. TCU, you got to think he's probably going to have a bounce-back game. He does not turn over the ball. I mean, he had five interceptions last year, and he already has seven this year. He's not a guy that turns over the ball, so you got to think he's going to be real careful. Probably dink, dink and dunk K-State usually. And some of that Tom Herman called a fluke earlier this week at his press conference. He said two of those four interceptions were actually the fault of the wide receivers running the route or running the wrong route, whatever it may be. He put the blame on for two of those interceptions on his receivers. And the third one was, a, I think, a fourth down throw where he had to get rid of the ball anyway so because it, it does, does you no good to take a sack, so you take the risk anyway. So... I think he only faulted Ellinger for yeah. one of those four interceptions. Uh, was it two weeks ago against TCU? Yeah. yeah, two weeks ago. What do you think about Sam Ellinger in, in general? I mean, obviously it's a guy who going into the season had a lot of hype. I don't even know if he's lived up to that kind of hype, but he's still been a solid player, right? Yeah, solid player, really good football player still. I will say I thought he'd be better than what he has shown this year. That's not to say he hasn't been good. I think I just had enormous expectations for what Ellinger was going to do this year. I thought he would be better yeah. than Jalen Hurts. Clearly, a lot of people did, yeah, too. Clear, yeah. Clearly, I was wrong on that. That's not to say Ellinger's been bad. He just hasn't exploded onto the scene like I thought he would. Yeah, no doubt. Um, and then, I guess, like, what else about this offense? Talk about the running backs. You, you brought it up, how they like to rely on those guys sometimes. Tell me how uh, K-State's going to have to stop those guys. It's, their running back room's kind of been like Kansas State. It's, they, use, they can use a lot of different guys. But a lot of different guys have been hurt for them this year. I think they had three or four running backs out one game where they had, I think, play someone that hadn't played running back all year at running back. So kind of in a bruised and battered group, but they've ran the ball well. It's actually turned out to be one of their strong points despite um, being injured as, as much as they have. Yeah. And then K-State's defensive line the past few weeks has really disrupted the backfield and disrupted the quarterback a lot. So how much is that going to be? I mean, it's tough because Ellinger can make plays with his legs as well. Um, but so could so could Jalen Hurts, and they were able to to win that game. So tell me what they're going to have to do there. Yeah, climate kind of compared defending Ellinger to what they face when defending Jalen Hurts because you have to be, you know, we were at both the run and the pass from the quarterback position. Um, they'll have to do that again this week when, when facing Ellinger. I think Ellinger's probably running probably worries me a little bit more just because I think quarterbacks have gotten loose against K State. Yeah. Max Duggan did. Yeah, <laughs> no doubt. So, uh, <laughs> so that tackles so, yeah, so that kind of I think if I, if I'm worried about a running threat from Texas, it, it's probably more from Ellinger. Um, whether it be broken plays or design runs, I think that's something to pay attention to this week. But Kansas State's defensive front is playing really good football. Trey Deshaun said the last two weeks might be the two best games of his career. Um, so that's saying something. Wyatt Hubert's obviously all Big 12 caliber. Uh, Drew Wiley's coming on. Trey Deshaun raved about him on Tuesday. Uh, Jordan Mitty's been good all year. He's probably been their most consistent lineman. Reggie Walker, best game last week. Last week was his best game of the season, too, I thought. So uh, the defensive front for Kansas State's definitely playing really good football right now. 
And then talk about the linebacking core. I feel like it's the one one position besides maybe safeties we haven't touched on yet in this podcast. I mean, Daquan Patton had a pick against KU. Um, yeah, that, I mean, that interception yeah. was, was just a great defensive call. Great That's got a Hazleton. Uh, they had Patton drop in coverage and go exactly where the ball was going to be mm-hmm. thrown. Carter Stanley must have predetermined the throws because he threw it without seeing Daquan Patton either. He didn't see Daquan Patton or he threw it. He was going to throw that ball no matter what. Yeah. But still, great great defensive play call by Scotty Hazelton, staying one step ahead of KU. He'll have to do the same thing when playing uh, when they face Texas on Saturday. Uh, the linebackers have been solid all season. Yeah. Uh, struggled in the run fits a little bit earlier on in the season when they got exposed a little bit, especially against Oklahoma State, I felt like. Uh, some of that was probably an experience on the part of Daniel Green, but he continues to make strides. Sullivan's been solid. Patton's been solid. And they're now starting to get Cody Fletcher back into the rotation as well. That's definitely a plus. So, I mean, I mean, before I ask, like, where, where, who do you think has been the strength and weakness of this defense so far this season, how about Jerron McPherson's pick against KU? I mean, that was – talk about an impressive catch. Uh, I think uh, you probably had a better view of it. You had a really good shot of it in the video. Uh, yeah. I didn't realize it was that good of a catch when uh, – I didn't when, realize you when, back <laughs> Until I saw, <laughs> saw your highlights. Yeah. So, so, no, phenomenal catch. I'll tell you what, if, if you're going to talk about one position on the field – you could talk about a number of positions on if you over Kansas State that are night and day different from last year. Mm-hmm. But the nickel position is one of those, I would say, because Jerome McPherson yeah. and Jonathan Thurum yeah. both have been playing lights out at that spot. Um, you can't ask for much more than what they have provided. Uh, so I, you got to love, uh, lo- love that from them. But if I'm talking, you know, you know, what's the strength, the weaknesses of this team um, from the defensive standpoint? You know, probably not a really glaring weakness. Yeah. They have to continue to be to defend the run, continue to get better at defending the run. That was definitely a weakness. Just because they held KU in that department, mm-hmm. I'm not sure if it's that concern has completely disappeared. Uh, Texas will try to run the ball. So mm-hmm. I, I, I guess I need to see more from them when it comes to defending the run. Their pass defense continues to be great, um, whether that's – because they're getting pressure on the quarterback or playing great in coverage. I think going into the Oklahoma game, they were the number one pass defense in the Big 12. I don't know if they still are. They might be. But I do know that KU, according to Bill Connolly's from ESPN, you know, his uh, analytical information that he provides every week, KU was at a 0% success rate on passing downs, and that, that's pretty unbelievable for a defense to be able to you know, hold an offense to 0% success rate on, on passing down. So clearly they're still getting the job done in that department. Uh, I think Scott Hazleton was asked about his great pass defense almost a week ago or maybe two weeks ago, and he thought some of the credit to the pass defense was because uh, the opposing offenses weren't passing the ball as much because they were having so much success running the ball yeah. on K-State. So he wasn't really uh, – glowing about his past defense as much as everyone else. He said the past defense is probably playing as well as they are because people are, are running the ball so yeah. much on us. So, But I think some of that got better last week against KU. No doubt. Talk about the back end. I mean, that's the last position that we haven't really talked about. Will Jones and, and, and Denzel Goolsby, what do you think you've seen from Wayne those? Wayne Jones. Wayne Jones, yeah. Will, will Jones. Jones. <laughs> you know, yeah, will Jones will play a lot next year. Uh, Gosh, that's going to be really hard. <laughs> will Jones will play a lot next year. They like him and Tyron Lewis, some of the young younger defensive backs on the roster. Logan Wilson, too. Uh, safeties, spotty play this year. Probably a little bit uneven. Yeah. I think Denzel Goolsby has been pretty good for the most part the yeah. last two or three weeks. Wayne Jones is... He's either really, really elite or, or kind of make, makes a little bit of a knucklehead play, a little feast or famine on his part. He just needs to get more consistent. Yeah, and more experience. I think we'll, uh, that with experience, more of that will come. But I say it's time to now flip to the other side of the ball. Let's talk about K-State's offense going against this Texas defense. Um, the Scott, offense is humming. I know. That's, this, is the one, this is the one that's fun to talk about. I mean, and it, it, it can only get better with those two running backs coming back. Yeah, if, yeah if, 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 if they come, come back. back yeah. yeah, we we got a little bit of uh, what I want to say, a little bit of information yeah. regarding that. But, but it still seems like it's up in the air, right? Yeah, no, uh, it does. Yeah. I mean, it, but I, I tend to think they're going to play because – I tend to think – it almost sounded like Chris Kleiman wanted to play only one of them. Because he's like, yeah. well, we have both back. Uh, we'd like to have one. That's what yeah. he said. So I wonder if they're not trying to get James Gilbert another week. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, it, it certainly seems like they're both 
uh, tracking to play. James Gil- he, Chris Klein said he didn't think James Gilbert could play last week. James Gilbert kind of disagreed, said he thought he could. Uh, Jordan, that Jordan Brown did play two snaps. Chris Klein said he wasn't himself, so they pulled him out. Jordan Brown also kind of disagreed, said I, I thought it was fine. No, no, and it wasn't like they were pissed off about it or anything like yeah. that. But uh, certainly they they thought <laughs> that, that <laughs> they, certainly they thought they were healthier than what the head coach you know kind of let on at the, at that point. So I would say they're both tracking to play. I definitely still feel that Jordan Brown is a step ahead of James Gilbert. It certainly sounded like that if you talked, if, if you listened to what Chris Kleiman had to say yeah. on Tuesday. And I feel like you would think that anyway, just because yeah, jo- uh, Jordan Brown, or, yeah, Brown did get those few snaps against KU. Gilbert was out completely. Both were suited up though, which yeah. makes me think, man, if they're both suited up against again on Saturday against Texas in a game you need them if you want if you want a good chance to win. Um, I do wonder I if there was play. yeah I do wonder if there was an element to hey yeah. score two touchdowns in the first two possessions yep. we might just not need these yeah. two guys this yeah. second. I think it's kind of crazy how it, it's basically two offenses one with Gilbert and Brown and then one without because you see the triangle formation we saw the all game against mm-hmm. Oklahoma and then we didn't see it at all against KU so once they're two in you see a whole different offense so. Yeah, I would agree. Yeah. Uh, it's hard to – and I think they love the diamond formation, but it's hard to run it without Gilbert and Brown because uh, you have Tyler Burns and Harry Trotter, and, and they probably don't have all of the playbook available to them, especially in sh- freshman Joe Irvin, of course, yeah. is a guy that plays up with Trotter, at least did against KU. He's so new to the system, um, so new to college football, and I wonder how much he can actually absorb. So, yeah. And – Jack Stanine's back there, so you got another freshman. So I think they have more of the playbook at their disposal when James Gilbert and Jordan Brown are in the game just because they probably have to condense it a little bit more when you have someone younger in the uh, playing like Joe mm-hmm. Irvin. Expand on what you thought you saw from Trotter. I mean, he had a solid game against KU. He's just um, solid every yeah. week. Uh, what you see is what you get, and it's uh, reliable. Mm-hmm. Good in pass protection most of the time and someone that's going – to just, you know, just yeah. give you the type of performance you need, and I, James Gilbert was certainly proud of him he, the way he glowed about Trotter on Tuesday. So I think it was good for the room. Good, for, good, good. They have a lot of pride in being able to rush for what was it, almost 400 yards yeah. against KU without their top two backs. Yeah. And, and obviously, Skylar Thompson has a lot to do with that as well. And I think it had to do a lot with uh, Harry taking first string uh, reps. Is he got to see mm-hmm. the holes open. I think Kleiman talked about it, him taking first reps, snaps. It was really helpful so he could see what is going on with the first team. I mean, the thing is, though, like now it's starting to look like if if Gilbert and Brown are back, I mean, it's hard to think you see a bunch of these guys anyway because they usually go with those two throughout the game. But, man, even Tyler Burns at the end of the game, I know it's garbage time, but he looked like a man running that football and he would not go down (laughs) yeah yeah no that was clear uh and his two carries were pretty impressive Uh, there's no way to other way to describe that uh and he's probably a good compliment to have when you don't have james gilbert to be honest um because he's uh, he's a lot like james gilbert and that every time we have seen him though it's hasn't been in significant uh meaningful snaps uh he's gotten more yards with the plays blocked for just because he runs through arm tackles and he's a little bit more of a load than, mm-hmm. than they have you know, outside of James Gilbert. He probably provides something that they don't have when they don't have Gilbert. Um, but I still think that I would – I don't think we've seen enough from Burns in – or at least outside of garbage time mm-hmm. to, to warrant uh, – Significant playing yeah. time. I think if, if Gilbert and Brown are out, I think you still see Irvin and Trotter the most. But certainly Tyler Burns is someone that's oppressed the coaches. But I think what they, they love the most about him is you know, his unselfish play because he's really good in pass protection and he's really good on special teams. Matt Hall just sat down. I mean, are we, are we cussing over here? Is that what I mean? <laughs> yeah, I'm sitting over cussing. there. Listen, I'm sitting over there doing the YouTube Live with Kurtz, and he's I'm not even going to repeat the words he's saying on his station <laughs> over there because – I don't want us to get thrown off the air. And I'm over here, and I hear I hear Flander. Who? No, it's Dy. Dy's over here. Well, I said it right after. I said pissed off. You said it. God, I'm telling you, listen. Yeah, it's third time it's been said on this podcast. Easy. Boys. I'm just. I mean, I'm getting so mad about it. I'm about to start cursing. But no, I'm excited. Look at the chat last I'm, night. I'm excited. No, I'm no. I mean, Dy's first answer was fantastic. Like, I'm excited to be on the show. I'm not trying to come up and interrupt your flow. I want you guys to just keep talking. But I was just thinking, you know, breaking the fourth wall here. 
we could release this pod today, right? Yes. We'll go ahead and talk the K-State basketball game oh, tonight yeah, on here today. Will. Uh-huh. And we'll just do another pod later this week when we're down in yep, Texas. Yep. So, I mean, that's – I just wanted to say, like, because we haven't planned it, I love that you guys have the initiative to just get going. I'm really, being sincere, I love that. <laughs> um, but now I'm here now. I'm here, and I don't want to kill your flow. Just keep doing what you're doing. We'll talk hoops later, and I'm, yeah. I'm here to help. Well, we were, we were just talking about the running game of K-State and how good they've been And now you think and they're dumb for not playing Tyler Burns. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I heard it. I heard, all, I heard I saw him it. going to the Popeyes and Dalton Schoen the other day, and then they walked right out. They didn't want to wait in that giant line, I guess. But um, We talked about James Gilbert refusing to put that in his body. Did you say that on this? Oh, oh no, I've, he hasn't. Yeah, I didn't know about this. I've book. not said that. Well, but James yeah. Gilbert takes care of his body, unlike you, Flanders. Yeah, no, I know. Two in two days. And three I guess, in two days. And <laughs> I guess, unlike Chris Heron and Josh Youngblood. And was that Will Jones in that video? Maybe two. Yeah. Shown and all these guys. But yeah, he will not do it. James Gilbert takes care of his body, Flanders. Well, good for him. Yeah. <laughs> Did uh, Sean have his uh, shirt tucked in? That was a funny tweet. Did you see that tweet, oh, too? What? So, you know, Dalton Schoen had that big play where not the one when Skyler looked past the wide-open Nick Lenners and forced oh, yeah. it downfield yeah. for 46 yards uh-huh. and ended up working out great. But earlier where he, you know, he hit the B button or the, you know, the circle or whatever system you're playing on, he hit this, like, nine straight spin moves, but they're holding on the back of his shirt the whole time and it helped him bring him down. If he tucked his shirt, he might have scored. Wow. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So we, we covered the running backs a lot, I think, uh, Talked about how we hope to see Jordan Brown and James Gilbert against this Texas team. I mean, how big would they, how needed are they against this team? I, mean, I, I heard what Logan was talking yeah. about, and I think he's right there. I mean, K State's offense was, was fine. Yeah. Obviously, without him last week, and did a great job on the ground. And Harry Trotter's proven me wrong a number of times this year, and I don't disagree with Tyler Burns and Preston, and I know Derek and I both really like Joe Irvin, nope. but I think it's a big deal. You know, I think maybe against Kansas, who's just not very good. Um, some of that stuff doesn't show up as much. I wonder about Texas, who's not very good on defense either, yeah. but we know has better athletes. I would sure like to have, you know, my top two guys who I, oh, I feel, uh, for me, I'm more, I mean, James Gilbert's done a great job this mm-hmm. year. So when I praise Jordan Brown, I don't want to just be dismissing James Gilbert because he deserves any praise he gets. But I think Jordan Brown is, is, the, is the big playmaker we saw against Oklahoma. That was a big deal, I thought, for them. And I think they need him against Texas, too. I would, I would love to see him back against the Longhorns. Something that I haven't said yet that I think could be a play – I know I've said that um, I worry about them catching Texas at the wrong time, and I still do just because Texas is getting healthier, particularly, um, particularly on the defensive side of the ball. But I think one of the elements that kind of popped up in the, in the Oklahoma game that we kind of talked about all offseason is, is the, the premise that K-State's zigging while everyone's zagging a mm. little bit in terms, of, in, ter- in terms of the <laughs> offensive style of football that K-State deploys. It's, uh-huh. it's different than everyone else they're they're not that spread wide open offense that everyone else is preparing for every other week Tom Herman even mentioned that he's like K-State is such a large departure from everything that they have faced this year so it's good for them that they got two weeks to prepare for it because they probably needed it it probably benefited Mm -hmm. them in doing so but I still wonder if this is kind of not like Oklahoma where I thought there was a fellow sitting next to us to our left during the Oklahoma game uh from their, the Hoarder media members in Norman. And he even said before the game that he thought it was going to be a competitive game because he didn't think Oklahoma was built to defend what K-State does on offense. And I think we might be seeing that again this week because I don't think can Texas is technically constructed to defend what K-State offers. Let's talk about uh, maybe the – we talked about all the running backs, but who has the most rushing touchdowns for K-State right now? It's got to be Skylar Thompson, right? It's, what, seven in the last two weeks. <laughs> yeah. Jiminy Christmas. It's like Colin Klein. Yeah. Talk about that offense and how they run run him and how they do it effectively. Uh, yeah, they the I think the design runs are near the goal line most of the time, other than the, the quarterback draw deep in their own territory against TCU. Uh, but most of his yards are probably coming off – what aren't designed yeah. the scrambles mm-hmm. and and like Kleiman said a lot of that came because KU's playing man coverage and so the defensive backs are turning their backs on Thompson in the middle of the field's open in, in a lot of those cases but when it comes to the touchdowns yeah. you're referring to I think those are designed whether it be the speed option the draw uh QB power QB counter yep and w- what do you see this weekend against Texas with Skyler Thompson running the football I, mean, I think they're still going to have to uh, use it you think yeah. back to you know the last couple of years against Texas Case they had a lot of success two years ago against the Tom Herman team uh, with Bill Snyder, of course, but running Alex Delton against that Texas defense. Last year, Alex Delton really struggled against Texas. Skylar Thompson played better, you know, throwing it against him. But I, mm-hmm. I think it's still going to be a, a factor, and I agree with it, not wanting to be something you want to base your offense around for the healthier quarterback. But I hope that K-State does use him on, you know, as D.Y. said, red zone, 
third and short, fourth and short, those kind of things, um, because I think he's very good at it. We said last year, and I'm not trying to turn this into another Delton yeah. versus Skyler thing, but I said last year that I wasn't sure he wasn't a better mm-hmm. runner than Alex Delton. Yeah. I know Alex Delton's faster, but Skyler Thompson's better side to side. He's more physical. I think he might be a better runner. So I think it's an underrated skill of his, uh, and I think it's something they're going to have to use the rest of the year if they want to continue to have success like they have at a high level, I mean, a top yeah. 20 type level for the last couple of weeks. I think Skyler Thompson showed great pocket presence against KU, and throughout the year he's shown – some good stuff outside the pocket but let's talk about his passing as well I mean he's a guy who's shown some stuff I mean sh- tell me what you've seen from there he's probably definitely taking a step forward in in his comfort with the passing offense rather than what we saw at the beginning of the the big 12 slate I think that's been one of the differences some of it's because they're just running the ball better yeah. so more stuff is opening downfield receivers are making catches in tighter windows he's delivering the ball a little bit more accurately in those tighter windows he doesn't always see the underneath guy but he's seeing it more than he was at the beginning of the big 12 schedule for sure what is what does texas do really well on the defensive side of the ball matt not much right now nothing (laughs) (laughs) it'll be be better when they're healthy yeah yeah Yeah. i mean like i'm not trying to be cute you know but they just gave up 48 to ku at home their last outing (laughs) Uh, Oklahoma was getting 10 yards every time they snapped the ball. They're not good on defense. Yeah. We watched LSU, who's a great offense. Yeah. These are some great offenses outside of Kansas, you know, who have put up, you know, points on them. So it's not that they're just this trash defense. Uh-huh. I'm not trying to over-exaggerate it. And, like, do you, injuries have had a lot to do with it, too. But if you ask what they do well when yeah. they're healthy, we don't know. We don't know. <laughs> but I will say what they do have, we know, is they are big, uh-huh. they're fast, and they're athletic. I mean, so we know they do that. We know, we know they do that mm-hmm. well. If they can get to the spots they need to get to stop an offense like Derek's talked about, that they're not constructed to stop, they will probably have success doing mm-hmm. so because they're good athletes and they're good football players. But as far as what their scheme is, what they're good at, what they're hanging their hat on, all those cliches they get throughout right now, they're not a good defense. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, it's a fair question. I'm not trying to be a big yeah. butthead to you. God, but uh, <laughs> but they don't do anything well on defense right now, in my opinion. It's tough to know because we haven't seen Texas defense at full health in a all year, probably since the LSU game, really. But if they are healthy, their best players, their, the best defense players they have are in the secondary. Mm-hmm probably isn't a great thing to have when facing yeah. case they if you if you think about it but a guy like Caden Stearns he's probably their best defensive player yep. he's, he's a safety how about a guy I mean who I think takes a lot of guff as far mm. as a receiver for K-State but, but is solid solid contributor is Dalton Schoen I'll tell you I mean, what I'm yeah. glad you brought him up because uh I've given him some guff you know yeah. of course he's put the ball on the ground some in the past and even a couple times this year like all receivers do yeah but I'm glad you brought him up because I have asked a couple questions about him lately like I think he's playing at an, a, a very high level the last couple of games this is a guy who's now winning every 50 50 ball that goes his way for some reason despite not having great size mm-hmm. as Derek's told us a number of times he's a much better athlete than people give him credit for he's proven that for years like you I'm just gonna say you see a receiver like him yeah. you think possession guy good hands no speed not a big play and like he's almost the exact opposite he has kind of average hands but he's more apt to make the big play to make make guys miss to break tackles and to beat people when he's running the open field he may not run a fast 40 but he's not caught from behind a mm-hmm. lot so I just think he's done a great job and I think great's not too strong of a word he's made so many big catches the last couple of weeks he's not having you know six catches for 120 and two touchdowns there are a lot of yeah a lot of two three catches for 40 or 50 yards but man, they all feel yeah. big. A lot of them he's well covered on, and he's making plays for his quarterback. I just, I'm glad you yes. brought him up because I, if there's an unsung hero, there's a, mil- a million yeah. of them. We talked about Jordan Mitty early in the year, who's still playing. I'm not saying he's not, mm-hmm. but Dalton Schoen is now that guy for me who has been criticized a bunch to the point we're not recognizing how well he's playing, and he's playing great for Casey. Yeah, he's that security blanket for Skylar Thompson. It's he's seen. he's kind of has blossomed into, and I'll say very, very, but a very, very poor man's Jordy Nelson. Yeah, like yeah. It, it's always, always he's more similar to that than he ever has been to a you know. A yeah. Wes Welker or whatever yeah. you want to say. Yeah. Sorry yeah. to cut you off. I was no. passionately agreeing with what <laughs> no, you said. No, that was it. Yeah. I feel like the one thing we need to touch on, last thing with offense, is, is offensive line and how good they played Not so that far. well. <laughs> well. Four of them got on the PFF all Big 12 team, right? Oof. Yeah. I, I want to say something for this, too. Like, I walked up that. I'm whole torp today. You can watch on the video yeah. because I recorded the whole thing. I yeah. said, word for word to him, I said, hey, total transparency, I did not think your offensive line would be as good as it is. So I was wrong. <laughs> um, did you always think it would be? And he was incredibly respectful and that kind of stuff. But I just want to say that here. Like, I have written, I have said that I don't think they're that physically gifted up front, that I think they're getting the most they can, uh-huh. that they can't do that much more. And they've been way better than that. I mean, Kansas is terrible, but they did run for 342 against them. Go back two weeks, Oklahoma's not terrible. They ran for 213, got a lot of big plays against them. Running back injuries like Logan's talked about. Uh, they're playing really, yeah. really, really well. And I don't even know how – I don't feel like I even have the right to really say how good they can be from here on out mm-hmm. because I've misjudged them so bad already. So, I mean, we pretty much covered 
pretty much everything except for special teams, which we can't gloss over them because they've probably been as far, it's a six and two team, so everyone has contribu- contributed. But how good has special teams been this year? Yeah, I'd I'd have to really do the research and look at every other special teams unit in the Big Twelve because I'd I don't necessarily know what everyone has yeah. in that phase of the game. I know KU special teams is really bad, even though it didn't really hurt them against <laughs> yeah. K State, but. Uh, I would be hard pressed to, to maybe find a more complete special teams unit than what K State has trotted out there ever since the Mississippi State game. I think that's fair to say. They have a couple kick and punt returners who I think are on the cusp of breaking a pretty big play, especially Joshua Youngblood. Malik Knowles has already done so. Mm-hmm. Phillip Brooks is always going to have a really strong average. Devin Engtel probably had his worst week of the season, but with two punts that weren't mm-hmm. all that elite, but I don't expect that to be a trend moving forward. And Blake Lynch hasn't missed a field goal, I don't think, since the opener. Was You're- that was that the only one scared that um, Joshua Youngblood, he had a couple punts that let it bounce, and, man, that ball was spinning, and I was like, mm-hmm. and he picked it up, and I was like, oh, no. It's a weird. He's, he's, <laughs> he's, been, he's been good, but he's been kind of scary at times. You're right. It's, it's, it, some of those – there's some that I know you're referring to that I was sitting up there thinking you can't field that. No. But yeah. then there's some, too, where if you don't, you, you know this, right. too, that if that ball goes bouncing, a punt that you field that's a little unsafe at the 30, and I agree it's a little unsafe to field. If you don't field it, maybe rolls down to the 12, yeah. you know? So it is kind of a – I'll cuss. A damned if you do, damned <laughs> if you don't sometimes to where if you do field that ball and fu- field it and fumble it, people are going to just destroy you for yeah. it. But if you don't and let it roll down to the 5, people are going to just destroy yep. you for it. Right. So it can be tricky. But I, but I do agree it's a good point you bring up, and it's worth talking about. He's sure. made me anti um, more than one occasion, I think. But uh, – even when he does go after those balls that maybe you know you think uh, probably wiser not to, he hasn't really even come close to bobbling. No, I, I think we're, I think we probably we're just don't conditioned yeah. to be afraid of that. Stuff. Yeah, <laughs> right, we're just conditioned. Right. Yeah. yeah, but I think we probably have so at least didn't understand perhaps his uh, level of hands for someone that hasn't played yeah. a bunch of wide receiver because he hasn't really come close to losing anything. Just real quick, I pulled up the PFF numbers for special teams. Mm-hmm. You know, K State leads the Big Twelve at a ninety point two in special teams. They are got tied, it. They're tied with Baylor at a ninety point two. Last was Kansas at a fifty six point eight. Texas, if you're yeah, curious, talk about their PFF. Go across the board if you, you want to hear all about PFF. Texas. Yeah, I'll tell you PFF all about Texas. Texas. Yeah. Logan had something about special teams, though. I could tell you had something. Did and you? I cut you off. Uh, yeah, t- keep talking. Okay. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Texas across the board. PFF. Let's do it. Right. Overall, eighty five point four against an eighty six point four for K State. Offense, Texas, 80.6, K-State, 82.4. Passing offense, Texas, 81.2, K-State, 81.8. Very, very, very similar numbers so far. Pass blocking, Texas, 84.2, K-State, 80.9. Receiving, so pass catching, Texas only a 68.9, K-State a 72.4. Run blocking, K-State a 76.4, Texas an 83.4. That's wrong. That's rush offense, which is different than rush block, uh-huh. than run blocking. Ru- just pure rush offense. K-State 76.4, Texas 83.4. Run blocking itself, Texas is a 69.7, K-State's a 75.0. Defense, man, I mean, I just, I'm a PFF guy. I, yep. I believe in PFF, and I'll defend them, you know, a lot. But I don't, K-State's a 68.6 on defense, which is too low. Yeah. Texas is a 75.1 on defense, 73.3 on rush defense for Texas, 70.8 for K-State on the same category. K-State is tackling improved. They were worst in the Big 12 going into Kansas. Now they're second worst at 40.5 for tackling. But, Logan, I'll give you one <laughs> guess. Who's the worst tackling team in the Big 12 if it's not K-State? And then not Kansas. <laughs> oh, not, not Kansas. So, yeah. And if we're um, playing Texas this week as a K-State rider, who do you think it is? Oh, Texas. It is Texas. <laughs> Texas is the worst tackling team in the Big 12 at a 34.7. Pass rushed, again, very similar numbers. 69.5 for K-State, 69.0 for Texas. Nice as Kurtz would say. Coverage, Texas 71.9. So DY talks about the best players being in their secondary. PFF, at least on defense, would, would show the same despite uh-huh. the injuries. K-State just a 60.3 on coverage. It's K-State's lowest other than tackling score. So I know, I, listeners, I just rattled them all off to you, and I don't expect you to memorize all those. But kind of the key ones, a lot of similarities. Numbers are very similar through special teams. You know, again, two of the best three in the Big 12 at a 90.2 and an 87.9. If you're looking for the weakness for Texas off of there, it would be the tackling, 34.7, lowest in the Big 12. So if you're talking about motivation and how bad does Texas want to be there, how hard are they going to play, that could, you know, could tie into tackling too. And I think it's going to have a lot to do with how, how bad Texas wants this one. Oh, man. Yeah. He did you such know, a good job. He did. <laughs> I, just, I just read off numbers on my computer. I dominated, though. Something that I talked about earlier on this podcast is, is 
the, and I think me and Matt have kind of had this discussion before. It's, you always expect Texas to be a little bit more explosive than they've showed, especially right. especially yeah. in the last year or two under Tom Herman. And hearing some of those numbers kind of back that up, especially their, their wide receivers. You think they're, they're you look at their wide receivers just from a physical standpoint. Look at Colin Johnson, Colin Duvernay, like, Colin yeah. Johnson, Devin Duvernay, Brendan Eagles. Eagles made some terrific catches against LSU. I haven't really seen a whole lot of. I can tell this guy likes Eagles a lot. Te- Texas, <laughs> yeah. he had some great catches in that game, but. They just they don't have a lot of big plays for having some of the elite talent, or maybe I'm overestimating some of the elite talent. Who knows? But you would think that they would have more explosion in their offense. That they've shown and actually the most explosion in their offense, and I've said this already in this podcast, it's coming from the running backs, yeah, which right. is really a room that's been depleted. Right, a guy who was you know a backup quarterback who's their fifth string. I mean, makes yeah. So they like Derek said, maybe they make no sense. Maybe the athletes aren't as good as I give them credit for. They're probably not. I mean, but I still think that's I still think that's if we're looking for what's wrong, I think the athletes are closer to being good as they're hyped up mm-hmm. to be in the execution slash ability of Ellinger to take advantage of it down the field is the bigger problem. But I probably have to acknowledge what DUI is saying. It's probably a little bit of both. Maybe maybe those guys aren't as good as I say they are, too. Yeah. So since we're going to pod later this week probably. down in Texas, should we should we do predictions then or should we Why just throw I mean, them in let's now? Let's just do them because what if we get down there and yeah, we're like going to high school football games and we talk about something else? Maybe we talk about the That's only good basketball point. game. Who knows? So, yeah, let's go ahead. What if I change my mind? What if he changes his <laughs> mind? We want to do it again. So let's do, let's do this the Big 12. Let's do it. And, and K-State, Texas. And then we'll talk hoops for 15, 20 minutes. Then let all the listeners, you know, back to themselves. And we have to get it up quickly because the shelf life then oh, goes, goes to – Shit. At least for, for basketball. What did he say that oh. for? Nice <laughs> Louise. Yes, it's stuck we're gonna in get, there. We're going to get an expli- explicit rating. Um, <laughs> you, need to, you need to put an edit in there. He goes, beep. I like it. I like I'm it. not going to go in and find it. You're going yeah, to no, 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 find that an hour into that thing. So let's just look at the scores, talk some hoops. Get no the time stamp. Hope nobody notices that. <laughs> and we'll move on. Uh, let's, yeah, let's go through the Big 12 first. Uh, number 11, Baylor, headed to TCU. I mean, they almost lost one last week. To Oklahoma, was it Oklahoma State? West Virginia. Or West Virginia. Baylor, Baylor must launch Yeah. yeah. Uh, but they're still 8 0, headed to TCU, who just took down. Um, they I mean, lost they, to Oklahoma they State. Lost to Oak State this week, but beat Texas last <laughs> they week. Did. So, I mean, they're an up and down team. They lost to K State. They're a confusing team. They are weird. You know, Alex Delton's left the program, <laughs> Max Duggan's hurt. Weird stuff. Weird stuff. You won't go by the line, but I'll still tell you the line I'm anyway. Know the line. I'm curious what it yeah, is. Baylor yeah. by two right now. Man. So let's let's get it started off. Uh, uh, yeah, I'll yeah. start it. I think that had Baylor not had a come close call last week against West Virginia, then this would be an opportunity for to be a close call. But I think they learned from last week a more comfortable win. I picked TCU to beat Texas two weeks ago, and they did. And I want to do it again, but without Duggan, like I just don't. Know. I mean, Michael Collins. You watch him in the bowl game last. I mean, like I just don't know how they can move the ball. I think Baylor is cracking a little bit but this isn't the one i think i think like dy i think baylor beats tcu uh, tcu had four takeaways from texas last game still barely won yeah. i'll go baylor yeah give me baylor i don't as well. think baylor's as fluky as what national media thinks. i don't i don't either but mm-hmm. i just yeah yeah I don't. it's either. gonna be an interesting end of the year for the big 12 to see mm-hmm. um they still have texas and oklahoma to play or both of them. yeah yeah I mean, that's that's gonna be interesting um Texas Tech at West Virginia, both three and five teams, both, I mean, two new coaches there. This is a brutal game. I think Texas Tech is starting to slide and losing some of that confidence that they had early. I actually, West Virginia is going to win. I feel the same. I like Tech's program better. I like Matt Wells better. But I think, yeah, the last few weeks have gone better for West Virginia. They're at home. It's a long trip out there. Mm -hmm. I would also take West Virginia. West Virginia. Well, then give me the Vegas line at two and a half right now going to Tech ways. I'll take Tech here. (laughs) To, to okay. <laughs> take down uh, the Mountaineers. So last game before we pick the K State game, Iowa State five and three headed to number nine Oklahoma. Game of the week in the Big Twelve probably. Mm-hmm. It's a seven o'clock game. Is this gonna be like the first night game for Oklahoma? It's first yeah. not eleven. First o'clock. not eleven o'clock game. <laughs> <laughs> so who do you got here? The line is fourteen going to Oklahoma. I th- I think Oklahoma bounces back pretty well. My Sooners. I do, too. I think Oklahoma got some flaws exposed by K-State, and they're probably real, but I think Iowa State's... In KU. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's fair to say, too. But I think Iowa State's not particularly good. I think Oklahoma beats them in covers. I agree. Okay, there it is. Oklahoma big. Um, here we go, guys. Texas down in Austin. Number 20, K-State 6-2, and 5-3 and three, Texas. The line is right now Texas by 7. 2.30 kickoff. What do you got here? Now, this is actually probably the Big 12 game of the week. Didn't give it enough credit. I will say Texas wins by a field goal. 
Texas wins by a field goal. I mean, I said earlier, like, I'm ready to do predictions, but, like, I still don't I still don't have one. I, I guess what my gut tells me is I'd be surprised if K-State loses this game. Um, I just think that's the momentum K-State has behind them. I think Texas won't have as much to play for. You know, it's, it's so much unknown. Like D-Boy said, off the bye week, you know, how do you play with, you know, you're healthy, that's better, but those guys haven't played a lot, you know, yeah. off the bye week. I just don't – there's a lot of unknowns. I just think K-State's playing better right now, so I'll take K-State. That simple. How about this? I'll go uh, oh, K- uh, K-State, yeah, K-State, I mean, you, uh, 27, say, 26. Do you uh, not want to give I your score, score yet? I mean, hmm, 24-21. Okay. Texas. I'm, I'm going yep. K-State, 27-24. <laughs> I, I think there's a lot of things concerning with Texas. They've had some locker room problems. I think Tom Irwin's talked about it. They had like have some heart-to-hearts with their players. And I noticed after the – or people have noticed after they've scored in the TCU game, they never really, like, cheered on the – in the no sideline side yeah it was a big problem for them they've just had a lot of concerning things i think k-state's rolling and there's nothing to not pick k-state i feel like unless you're deep buying you hate K-State. <laughs> yeah i know and I, I guess i'm gonna be an old geezer too you switch the young bucks i'm gonna be an old guy and i'll pick texas here the home team <laughs> that's face right now i don't care i like this. Um, I like this. Uh, I'm, I'm gonna say yeah I, i'm gonna say 28 to 21 the interesting thing is I don't think any of the four of us have picked K-State games very well all year. No, no. I mean, I'm terrible. <laughs> no, I mean, I'm absolutely terrible. I am something like, I would bring it up, like 15-3 and three now against the spread the last two weeks on Powercat game day, but none of those are K-State games. <laughs> I mean, so. And I made $1,000. And Derek Young won $1,000 <laughs> oh, yeah, on that. Fresno State. I mean, like, so listen, if you need ga- national gambling advice, me and D.Y. Yeah, send, me picks, stuff, I mean, yeah send me your picks, guys. Send me those picks. I don't know the games I'm picking on Powercat game day until the day, until they ask me them. I sound like <laughs> I sound like a total degenerate when you say, because right. I know it was a parlay, no, no, but no, you said lying. on he Fresno put, State. He's lying. He put $500 straight up on Fresno State. Oh. Uh, no, he didn't. Um, that was scary. But too. yeah, if you're, yeah, again, if you're looking, listening for K State picks from us, I mean, that's your oh, mistake. No, yeah, no. <laughs> don't <laughs> no, do that. You listen to the KSO show for that. Yeah. DM me for my real pick. Hey, buddy. you know what I'm going to do? Just right now, you're not ready for this. I'm going to take over for the hoops part because you've okay. kind of been our hoops, like, kind of our guy. Right, and yeah, I don't want yeah. you to host it. I want you to be able to answer some of the questions all right, a little all right, bit. And I want right. to involve all you guys in the hoop stuff. Okay. So K State does open up. We'll be about, I'm going to let my clock here, about 10 or 15 minutes on this. K-State does open up tonight <laughs> against North Dakota State season opener after winning exhibition games against Washburn and Emporia. One pretty impressive, one yep. not particularly impressive. Which one, Flanders, is mm-hmm. on your mind more? Are you more encouraged by the Emporia game coming into this game mm. or seeing that Washburn game last? Is that more on your mind going into tonight's season opener? Man, that's, a, that's an interesting that's question. That's the only questions I ask. I know. Good ones. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I almost think – the the encouragement from Emporia is more so than than the than playing Washburn close because to me I still found encouraging things from the Washburn game yeah. too because Dejuan Gordon didn't play well against Emporia but showed his flashes against Washburn yep. so I think both games showed me things that this team with actual sets getting run by Co- uh, Coach Weber and 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 guys getting going I think it's going to be a competitive game Coach Weber made too. sure to say that. Uh, he wouldn't let you even you know, know. think, and you even said it probably would be. And he was like, "Oh, it's going to be competitive." I, know. I was like, "I believe you." Coach. Yeah, I, yeah. I do. I think you do see uh, all, f- you know, Cardi, Mike, Mac, Levi, and who am I missing there? And uh, Cardi, Mac, Levi, Cardi, all X, X, and yeah. X. Yeah, the big yeah. <laughs> you need, I guess. All five of those guys. I think you see them obviously most of the game. I, you're going to see other guys sprinkled in here and there, but they're going to first game of the season. They're going to rely on the experience. I really do believe yeah. that. You've noticed that throughout their uh, Bruce Weber's career here that he relies on experience. And in game one, when we've heard that guys, um, I think you might see Mont- Montavious Murphy might be the most minutes out of a newcomer because yeah. Coach Weber said he's, doing the best with yeah, the scouts out of exactly. all the newcomers. Yep. So you might see him the most. Dejuan's going to get a lot of playing time too, but I think they're going to rely on the experience in this game. Next question is going to be for both Derek first and then Logan. You can answer the same question <laughs> if you guys don't mind. Outside of the wins and losses tonight, which is very important, like K-State would be well off to win the season open tonight <laughs> against an NCAA tournament team in, in North Dakota State. Outside of wins and losses, though, D.Y., what's something that could realistically happen tonight that would be encouraging? Like, what's something you want to see that's not unrealistic? You know, not Tejuan Gordon scoring 75. <laughs> what's something that you think could happen tonight that you'd leave the game thinking, boy, K-State's good this year because they just showed me that? Uh, I think maybe a complete game for Mac because I think he's going to be an important player this year. I think in the first game we saw a good defensive Mac. In the first game, or in the second game, he scored, but he right. turned the ball turned over, over quite yeah. a bit. So just a complete game from him to bounce back and kind of get back to at least close to the form that we 
became accustomed to seeing. And same for you, Logan. Yeah, whether it's a player or a part of the game, like what do you want to see go well tonight for K-State? I'd say bench points. Like we just talked about, they're going to rely on their veterans tonight. Yep. And you want to have those bench points from, you know, Montavious is going to be a big part mm-hmm. off the bench. So I'd say bench points. Well, it's not on both accounts because, I mean, something Flanders asked yesterday is how deep in a game like this, yeah. you know, what that should be a competitive game, do you want to go? And Bruce Weber said eight, nine guys, that kind of stuff. So guys off the bench are going to be going to be important for sure. Flanders, I'm just curious about, there's not a right or wrong answer to this, your opinion on the start of the schedule for K-State. Mm-hmm. As Bruce Weber has kind of joked about, but he's being serious, he didn't know when he scheduled North yeah. Dakota State they'd be this good. They were yeah. to the middle bottom of their conference. Now they're picked to win their league this year. They went to the tournament last year. They won a game in the play-in game, whatever you want to call it, and then, you know, played mm-hmm. competitive against Duke for a half. The question I'm asking you is, for K-State, and a kind of a newish team, do you like opening up with North Dakota State at home, then going to UNLV right away? Or would you have liked a more stair-step, you know, Bethune-Cookman, Bethune-Cookman type first two games <laughs> of the schedule? You know, I'm the optimist, so I'm going to say I like what they have because I think you want to throw the guys in the fire anyway right away. You want yeah. to see what these guys can do against this, this tough team. And still you can rely on the experience like we've talked about. But – I like it because, yeah, like like you said, this North Dakota State team is going to be tough. They rely on experience. They're going to be an experienced bunch that's not going to be easy to beat. And and don't be surprised. I know people won't like it, but it's going to be a close game within two minutes left in the yeah. game. And, and then you said go to UNLV. Coach talked about how important that is to get the young guys – used to traveling actual early road and game. Yeah, yeah actual road games against an actually good team which that's a solid UNLV te- UNLV team solid coach there and I wish we could go to it that would be a fun game to go to yeah um, down at yeah in Vegas is that TJ Otzelberger now it is yeah mm-hmm. his first year there I know and uh, it's gonna run I think an up and down style that'll really test K-State and I think if you look at whatever you want to look at these days RPI whatever yeah. these first two opponents are both you know in the, in the you know low how would I say this? Like, if you look at, say, like yeah. 120, they're probably 120 or higher, which isn't great. No. But, I mean, again, you're talking about a lot of times you're opening up season against teams in the 260s, mm-hmm. 270s, 300s in the RPI. So it is, it is a bigger test. Derek, my next question for you is something that Flanders is talking about. I'm not asking you to be an expert on North Dakota State basketball all of a sudden or that kind of stuff. <laughs> that's good. But this is a game that's just an 11 point, 11 point, 12 point line, however you want to look at it. K State typically not a really high scoring team. I guess what I'm asking, are you like Flanders and expecting this to be a really competitive game in the last few minutes? Or would you think the Wildcats have a little more comfortable of a game tonight? Uh, just because uh, outside of their starting lineup, they're going to be playing mostly from the bench, probably a lot of youth, a lot of inexperience. And then going against the team with a lot of experience, I would imagine first game out of the gate, still some growing pains, even though it's not exhibition play. I think it'll be yeah. pretty within the margin. And similar for you, Logan, I'm not quite getting the predictions yet, but is this a game that you think like Bruce Weber is going to be, as you know, Chris Kleiman would say, a four quarters game, you know, in two halves? Or does Casey have a chance to pull away against this team tonight? I'm pretty sure it's going to be a close game. Yeah. And that's going back to the first question, I almost think it's not a good scheduling because you lose this game yeah. you put a lot of pressure on your young guys and your whole team to go on the road and UNLV you can't start the season 0-2 right so I don't disagree now listen I'm, now if you're like Flanders and you're a positive Pete and and Bruce Weber's perspective you love the challenges and it's great if you go 2-0 even 1-1 one one is probably great but I do think it puts a little more pressure on it too because we know how fickle fan base is not oh, just no K-State's doubt. but are and yeah if you lose to a nice North Dakota State team at home tonight and then go lose at UNLV on Saturday even though a lot of teams you know have rough starts and have good years um, people will be upset. So there's sure. a risk in it. For and then sure. you got the freshman doubting, right? You know, can I really play at this and win at this level? If we're going to talk about what uh, w- scheduling for the fan base, yeah, this isn't this isn't the the greatest thing. Unless they win them, for, yeah. <laughs> unless you know, they yeah. win them, but even close wins will be like, oh man, right. what's going on? But yeah, just think about K State losing to Tulsa these last two years in non conference play, and then going to the Elite Eight, winning the Big Twelve. K-State. To me, it's just non-conference doesn't mean that much. I hope they better they better lose to Tulsa again. I agree, lose to Tulsa again. <laughs> Keep it up. I mean, last you know, Tulsa lost one Elite Eight. Tulsa lost two Big Twelve title. Tulsa lost three national champs. I don't know. <laughs> Should we just um, wave the white flag? <laughs> I, think, I mean, at least it's in Bramble this year, right? I mean, so that's a good thing. And the other thing too is I don't have the stats in front of me, and I'm stealing from somebody else. I read it from Freak on the board or somebody else. But you look back at that the team that you know when Foster and those guys were freshmen, and yeah. they. 
they end up going 10-8 and eight in the Big 12 and beating KU once and playing Kentucky close in the tournament. Like That team was terrible in non-conference yeah, yes. early in the season. We're not trying to get out ahead of it and tell you as fans to be happy if K-State no. loses in non-conference. No, be, be mad. Like That's yeah. what you do. I mean, as a fan, I'm not talking down, but don't be shocked. Yeah. yeah, it's a bit of a challenge. And also don't immediately jump to the conclusion that if K-State looks rough in a couple of games, oh. it means they can't be good. Because yeah. college basketball, even more so than college football, teams will change significantly You know, from yep. game one to game 10 to game 30. And it's something I've brought up for, for a couple of years now since I've been with KSO that this team takes time anyway because especially this team this year I mean I wouldn't be surprised if they maybe lose one of these first two games right. because of the lack of experience and it takes I think time. it's as likely yeah. sorry to cut you off I think yeah. it's as likely they go one and one as yep. two and oh yeah. I agree yeah. Yeah, no doubt because it takes time for this team for these newcomers to learn defense and Weber's said that this offseason nonstop. so let's just run around let's make our predictions I'm going to go Derek and then Logan and then Flando to wrap it up this will be the end of our show. You know, the Tall Grass Tap House has been kind enough to have us here for the KSO show. Which so if is, you're I'm listening sure... to this after after we talk football, and it's after the basketball game, just shut it off. Right, right. If the basketball <laughs> game's over, just shut it off because we don't want you to be able to criticize this. Let's, let's, predict, let's predict both games. Point. North Dakota State well, we and you and Okay, let's pick. Uh, okay, yeah, let's do both games. We'll pick both games. Um, no, I can't do that because then I, I got to get in the mind about, like, yeah. About like who's gonna play yeah. well against UNLV and that kind of stuff. That's and that's tough. just we need something for Friday in Austin. Yeah, I was gonna do it, but let's just do North Dakota State. Give me a final score. Who you think's gonna be K State's best player tonight? And I want to thank People State Bank. <laughs> there are eleven locations through the state. <laughs> they have twenty three ATMs. They have six ATMs in Manhattan alone. Oof. Two locations for the bank in Manhattan. Thanks for them and Tallgrass Tap House today. DY K State North Dakota State. Give me a score. Give me a top performer. And then we'll move on to Logan. K State wins 68-59 so right around that 11 point spread I'm trying I would be creative, be creative. With, with the top performance because I'm not necessarily sure it'll come from what we're accustomed to seeing I'm going to say Mike McGurl I like Ooh, it I like, I it, like it because you know he's played really well he's had made shots if you make shots tonight you'll probably have a really nice game mm -hmm. Logan we got I just don't know that much about North Dakota State yeah, I know they okay. have uh Pretty much a team that went to the NCAA shoot, tournament. Shot it really well late last year. Yeah, kind of dependent on shooting threes. They'll shoot their fours and five. Will shoot threes. Yeah, they're kind of a yeah. yeah. And I went to Lake South, and I like the East had a kid that plays on North Dakota mm. State right now, Cameron Hunter. He's pretty good. Uh, I'm gonna go K State still. I'll go something like 67, 61 K State. A little closer. And who do you like to play well for K State tonight? If you had to, you know, if you had to pick one guy who's gonna stand out, who do you feel good about? I'll go Cardi. Okay, Flanders. 71-65, K-State gets the win, and the guy I'm going to go with is, I mean, can we go with him just all year? Just mark him down X. I mean, he's going to do it mark all him for down. him. And, yeah, defensively, offensively, he's he's a beast, and he's going to show it. This year he's going to be very impressive on the offensive end. I'm just going to give the most outlandish probably of everyone, perhaps. I like K-State 62-60 tonight, an absolute nail-biter. And the player of the game is Dejuan Gordon, uh, who pressed too hard the first two games. I think he'll settle down a little yes. bit tonight. I think he'll be K-State's top performer tonight in a two-point win that we're all terrified of and talking about on the site <laughs> after the fact. But I think if they play anything like Washburn, I don't think they're winning this game. Probably not. <laughs> Probably not. I think it's going to be an interesting one, though. That's going to wrap us up on the KSO show. Grant Flanders did a admirable job mm. hosting the first 75 percent of it i think logan and dy did a better than admirable job of being guests yeah, they were way uh great host today you had a couple no beers today no just a professional oh, man course. okay so for Darius <laughs> young for grant flanders for logan mance that's it for the kso show please tell your friends tell them <laughs> yes